Hey out there survivors and welcome back to another episode of Let's Survive Interviews. Today I am absolutely delighted to be joined by one of the creative forces behind one of my uh, newly found most favourite franchises in the world. A, ga- a series that I slept on for way too long, which is uh, the Life is Strange series. Uh, we have a senior game designer, I believe. I hope I didn't mess yep. that up. That's good. That's <laughs> from, good. I did my research. See, I'm not too bad. Uh, <laughs> from Square <laughs> Enix, uh, yep. Alejandro Arque Gallardo. Oh, that's awesome pronunciation. <laughs> that's awesome. Yes. I think it's the first one that said it. <laughs> Like straight, good, good. Yes. There you go. I knew Last having my, my friend Abel would be so proud of me. I have a friend from Spain, Abel Garcia, and he's going to be like, good Ooh. job, Patty. <laughs> good job. <laughs> that was good. That was good. That was yes. good. I think that's the first time I haven't butchered somebody's name on the show. So. <laughs> so the thing is, I'm so used to someone not being able to pronounce Alejandro, and he's like, yeah. <laughs> oh man uh alejandro thank you so much for being here uh i we met through a mutual friend of ours barry keating yep. who's another wonderful game designer creative yep. narrative storyteller uh, i must get barry on the show why i haven't at this point <laughs> but i think i'm just i think i'm keeping him on keeping him on the lead like you know keeping him waiting <laughs> yeah, that's good that's good that's good it's like you can tell hey produce something awesome so i can bring you in <laughs> exactly so, get on yeah <laughs> I used to work with him. That's the thing. And it's, he's, 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 we used to work in Madrid together. Oh, wow. Yeah. Yellow. So that's how I know him. And he's, he's amazing. Oh, he uh, is. We met through at Fright Fest, actually, uh, in <laughs> London, because uh, he was over there with Man of Medan, I believe, yep. uh, hosting a panel for Man of Medan. Mm-hmm. And uh, I was there with my second feature film. Um, nice. So yeah, it was that was my first time ever having that. Like that was my dream festival to premiere at, uh, because I've been going for five years at that point, and I loved it. And I, and I was like, all I want to do is make a film that gets into Fright Fest. That's all I want. <laughs> I'm gonna say the next thing you need to go. I don't know if you know this uh, place uh, in Spain. We have in Sitges. Oh, Sitges. Festival Fantastico. I, I mean, I'm from Barcelona, so I used to go every single year. That's the <laughs> Oh, Sitges is another. There's like three horror festivals that are in the world that I really, really like. One is Fantastic Fest in Austin, Texas. Yeah. One is Sitges, and one and the other was Fright Fest. They're my three like. They're there you the, go. The cream of the crap, you know. <laughs> one marked. One, yeah. Two, two to go. <laughs> oh man! But Alejandro, I'm going to tell you right. I got Life is Strange, the first game, when it came out. So that must have been 2013, 2014. 20, I think it's 14, 15. Yeah, yeah for, the, for the first Life is Strange. I remember I got yeah. it at launch, the first episode, and yeah. I loved it. I played it, I loved it. And yeah. then I think I played the second episode when it came out, and I loved that. But then whatever happened in my life, things got really busy, and I forgot that episode three, mm-hmm. four, or five. I think I bought the season pass at the time, and then was like, mm-hmm. but never came back to it. I finished it, yeah. Never came back to it. And... um for years, I've had people telling me on film sets, my makeup, uh, the makeup girl, Becky Tuberty, on this film kept being like, how have you not played Life is Strange? It's such a you game. You would love it. And I was like, yeah, yeah I'll get back to it. I'll get back to it. But the lockdown has, if if anything, it's brought me back to a lot of games that I've missed out on. And uh, I played the first Life is Strange off stream because I didn't want to... Uh, um, I kind of wanted to just enjoy it myself. I didn't want to have to share that with other people. <laughs> yeah, no, no, fair enough, fair enough. I can I can understand that. And uh, I played the second one on stream, but I'll talk about that a little bit later. But the first game, being detached from it for a long time and coming back to it, it's incredible. It's exceptional from a, from a narrative standpoint. Characters, which are my my number one thing. I'm like, I don't care. Like, you can't have a good story without good characters. I don't care. Like. Agreed. Yeah, like, but uh, I just want to know, like, for, what was it like being part of that, developing that game, and bringing it to life? So it was, it was, it was a lot of roller coaster, I have to say. Um, thing is, so I worked Square Enix, not a Donut, so Donut yes. are the uh, developers, same as before the storm was done by Deck Nine. So what what do we do? At least let me explain a bit how <laughs> how that kind of trip went on so basically what we do in in square enix external studios which is the the group i belong to they kind of like developers come to us they show us their games they want to do and kind of say okay you know this looks good let's work together and that's what we do we're not like a publisher a typical publisher that goes like here's the money give it yeah. the game i'll market it 
So our group basically assigns a designer, usually a producer, art director, technical director, and we work with the teams like next to each other. Oh, wow. Well, okay. Uh, through the whole uh, process from the first day till the last day. That's okay. incredible. It's more like a, a film production almost, like as in, because when you go like, okay, there are different models in film as well. You can just go get the money and then you go off and make the movie. But you oftentimes you'll find a partner and you'll have to work together mm-hmm. through yeah. the whole process. Yeah. That's that's more or less how, how it was. In, in case of Life Strange, so Donut came to, to Square, they were pitching for something else, then they went kind of like, hey, have a look at this little thing that we have here. And they showed kind of like this scene where uh, David comes to the room and uh, get, grabs Chloe smoking weed. Oh, yes. And that's a big slap there. Yeah. Which everyone was kind of shocked. And we're like, ooh, is this? I mean, keep in mind that by that time, that was not no. normal, I think, in games. I was like, oof. But we all kind of, people that saw it loved it. I was handed the the, the kind of like overall narrative arc mm. of the game, what they wanted to do. And I never done a narrative game before, but I wanted to. Yeah. And kind of read that, loved it. Like said, I want to I want to be part of this because this is different. This kind of touches me in different different aspects. Um, so I really want to be, I really want to do something like this. I remember yeah. my boss saying, hey, Alejandro, this is not a triple A game, you know, it's a quite small. Are you okay doing this? I'm like, I don't care if it's not triple A. <laughs> yeah. I'm like, I, I really don't care. I just want to work on games that I love. That's amazing. That's that's all I cared always. Uh, yeah. That's all my work has been. If I love something, you have me there. Don't care about money or like, no, I work for projects. Yes. I know it sounds weird or, or typical, but that's how I work. I empathize. I mean, that's I. I couldn't. I. People have said to me often, like, oh, "Why don't you become? If you're if you're struggling financially, Patty, why don't mm-hmm. you just become a director for hire and just work on TV shows that you have no passion for?" And but I, I couldn't do it. I couldn't go in and be on a set that I was not enjoying myself on. I yeah, and it it doesn't mean that I have to work only on my own projects, but it yeah, does mean that exactly. I have to find a project that excites me. I I literally, it's funny because. I'm just moving into starting production on a film at the moment and it's not my script. It's Uh a coming of age drama comedy, which is not necessarily my wheelhouse, (laughs) but I read the script and like you said, it moved something I went in 2004 because the the movie is set in 2004. This was me. I was this little goth punk kid that didn't know his place Mm -hmm. in the world. And so straight away I resonated with it and I was like, what can I do to help this movie get made? What, where put me where? So I totally, I totally understand and empathize. (laughs) So, so that was for me, and then basically we were working on that. I mean, it was it was a kind of a strange game because no one knew what was going to be doing. We worked our assets off. Um, we didn't still don't know if people will react okay. So we released the first episode. We all streaming in Limited Universe, thinking, is this good? Is it going to be? I mean, we love it, yeah. but is people going to love it? Yeah, you know, it's it's. it's now, and the first reactions were kind of mixed to begin with, but then kind of because we were getting all oh, characters are very stereotyped. But we were like, okay, just wait, because, you know, we need the stereotypes. We need to break them. But you need yes. to know them and then so we can break them later on. And then you'll get a bit more attached to the characters. And yeah, people, I think people started to see that at the end of episode two. Yes. Where people were like, ooh, okay, so it's not, coming of an age not 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 your average coming of an age story has more it's not about a teen normal teen drama there is some of that i'm not gonna deny it yeah after that is like doing the rest it was because every scene was kind of created in a we wanted to be very respectful for the themes that we were talking about the gameplay the the, everything needed to be really good Mm. for for our standards Uh, so we were very nervous all the time if we were doing justice to what we wanted to do to be honest yeah no it's it's crazy because i i think one of the things that works so well in the first life is strange is the fact that there is very basic at its core there is very basic ideas of what it's like to be a young person and the world not understanding you and not and you not understanding the world you're like well none of this makes sense to me either and then i think the but the great thing is, like any good story, when you have that that core that is so instantly relatable and understandable, 
all the kind of more outlandish elements that are built on top of it, like the rewind time, like the the, the kind of some of the other components of the narrative, it, it it makes them more accessible as a player because you're like, well, I've already rooted in understanding that I'm just this, this teenage kid yeah. that doesn't understand really who they are. And then it's like, what have you the power to change things? It's like, whoa. <laughs> you think back to your teenage years, and you're like, oh man, imagine if I had, had these powers when I was 18. Are you serious? <laughs> but, but that was kind of key for, for, for the character of Max, that yes. person that keeps doubting herself, like she's kind of like very insecure, giving yeah. her the option to rewind as many times as she wants till she gets what she thinks she wants. Mm -hmm. It's just kind of like, I mean... She will. She could st stay still on that moment, trying again, again, again. Yeah. And never wanted. And that's kind of a bit, kind of the core. If you think of the choices that we presented to the players, no one was a perfect good choice or no. bad, or really <laughs> bad choice. Everything seemed good and bad at the same time. It's like okay, it's, this is good because of this, but it's not. Maybe in the future, it's not going to be that good. And that was the whole thing. Like you making yourself doubt. Yes, about you were going to choose, you know. Uh, that was never more true, right? Like it's it's there in Life is Strange one hundred percent, but every decision in Life is Strange two, every single decision in that game, I have a whole. I'm cutting up my vods and putting them up on YouTube at the moment from my Twitch stream. Every single decision, I'm just sitting there going, I I don't guys. I don't have a fucking clue. I don't know what to do. I don't know what to do. I was so scared at every decision because it like that. It felt like. Especially in that game, I, it, it was definitely there in Life is Strange 1 as well, but I think I just felt it much more. Maybe it's because I was streaming it and I was in front of an audience or something that I suddenly felt this pressure of like, oh, this is a decision and you better make the right choice. Um, but yeah, it's uh, it's harrowing, the decision making in these games. Truly harrowing. <laughs> and I can tell you, we, we went through every single choice from, from the choosing the right words to uh the staging before and what the character says after that choice is being mm. done is really curated so we spend a lot of time on those iterating finding because what we saw as well is that if a choice the word or, or the sentence between two choices or three choices one looks slightly more positive than the rest people tend to choose that yes so <laughs> Which is a good thing if you look at it from the part of point of view of humanity, okay? <laughs> People tend to, even though we like to pretend that we are badass and, you know, I'm going to be cold and I'm going to be... Um, we we end up finding out that people always choose the good. So if something was clearly something good, people will choose that. Okay, and we yeah. Kind of, and we knew this, I mean... Some of that stuff came out because we do what we call focus test. Mm. So we grab the game, we put it in front of a bunch of players, we record them uh, on video, we get uh, uh, analysts doing kind of a full analysis on what they've done. And then we see how they reacted to different choices. It's like, okay, this, like everyone chose this one. Why? Yeah. And kind of looking very detailed into what the reactions were and how they were and we're like okay maybe we change it again and we change it be more neutral we'll be more negative that word that sounds too positive then test it again that kind of 50 50 choice which is cool then that's what we want we want something that makes you think twice on what you really want to do yeah i will say that i am just very glad that like unlike unlike other games uh that have these si similar ish branching narratives mm -hmm. one thing that i appreciate a lot in life is strange is that there is rarely a time limit on your decisions like in a lot of those games it's like you make a decision right now you've got 30 seconds or 15 seconds i think in life is strange sometimes it, it it you still kind of make a decision relatively quickly because you feel because there isn't a timer ticking down mm -hmm. and sometimes mm -hmm. the decision could stay there for ever sometimes the decision <laughs> could stay there for 20 seconds so you're kind of like like, a great example of that is, without getting into the spoilers of it all, the very last decision of Life is Strange 2, I literally sat there on stream for, I think, eight minutes, just mm -hmm. me 
going, like talking to the audience and being like, guys, I don't know what to do. If I do this, this is going to happen. If I do that, that's going to happen. And like, I was, I was, I was crying. I was a mess. I was just an absolute disgrace. <laughs> like, um, and that's good. That's good. That's why exactly. We that's what media should do. Like, it, it should blur the line between the character and the player. And Life is Strange one and two did that for me. I haven't played Before the Storm yet, which I really am excited to get around to. So what I'll say about Before the Storm, which was so when we finished Life is Strange one, we went straight away to do Life is Strange two. Yeah, but it, but we kind of saw that it was going to take a long time to do. I was trying to because we wanted to do something different, kind of innovate a bit a lot more into what we did in one. We took our time as well to to see what makes a Love is Strange game a Love is Strange game. Yes, yeah. we didn't know to be honest. We did <laughs> the first one, and I was like, cool. But now, if we need to do a sequel, what's Love is Strange in general? <laughs> yeah, you know? of course. And and then, kind of in the meantime, kind of we were talking in Square. We were talking to Deck Nine. And they were presenting another narrative game. Was like, you know what? Maybe we need something in between. Yeah. And I love that story about Chloe because I know there are some people that do not like Chloe from the first Love is Strange. But she's a bit toxic or seems to be a bit toxic. We wanted to tell her story so you understand who she is and who is a story that happens three years before the events of Love is Strange 1. Mm. So if you haven't played Love is Strange 1, you're not me, you're not gonna miss things yeah because we're not connecting the stories massively um but you get to see who chloe was three years before the events and basically kind of every game has main core theme core theme okay? yeah before the storm was you know it's about friendship what happens when someone comes to your life that changes everything in your life this was this person was Rachel. rich lambert yeah i had a feeling Chloe, Chloe is, kind of, this is not a spoiler, this is yeah. very no, it, beginning. Okay? Chloe was going through the um, pain of losing William. Yes. Something going on on the house, a friend that goes to her massively, and you can imagine who that friend is. Yes. Um, and she was kind of basically rebelling against everything, and someone appears and changes her world from not wanting to leave to, this is wonderful. Yeah. Basically. And that's kind of three days on their lives. Oh, I, I'm very excited to check it out because, like, the world building in the first game is so good, like, in setting up. Uh, I mean, one thing I will say is this is maybe the best compliment I can give Life is Strange 1 as well, is that when you first start playing Life is Strange 1, the first thought I had was this is a bit like, and this is not the compliment part, so I'm like, okay, but okay. don't worry, we'll get there, okay? okay, uh, okay. <laughs> the first thought I had was this is a little bit like a, like a Riverdale CW kind of yeah. teen drama show, right? Mm -hmm. And that's fine. That's that's cool. But the compliment, getting to the compliment, is by kind of episode, the end of episode two, maybe midway through episode three, I started to go, oh, no, wait, this is not... This is not Riverdale. This is if the CW did Twin Peaks. Like, this is Twin Peaks. Um, which and, is incredible. Yeah, <laughs> yeah and, and that was one of the influences. I mean, the game directors, Raul and Michelle, had uh, Twin Peaks as being one of the main influences for, for their work. So... That was that's that's a great compliment. Thanks, thanks, thanks a lot for it. I it's, mean, it's, it's, I mean, just the whole the the, the Rachel Amber story and everything, and and <laughs> even the dark room, everything. It just echo like straight away. I grew up as a kid watching Twin Peaks with my parents at an age far too young to be watching anything like that, and I just I yeah I straight away once that stuff started to really come into the the fro the four. I think it was maybe around the time you start invest interrogating Frank Bowers. Maybe I started to yeah. kind of go, oh, this feels like Twin Peaks. You got these kind of zany-ish characters in the world mm -hmm. that aren't quite like they're kind of that suburban American kitsch kind of like yeah something just a little bit off about them but they are a stereotype but no <laughs> yeah I mean I, I always give the, the perfect example so in episode one if you let's say when you try to enter the room the bedroom of the girls you get Victoria there you know and you can have fun of her or yeah. not after what happens. I'm not going to spoil too much. And up until that point, that character has been very one dimensional. She's the queen bee yes. of, of the place. But you get to go to her room. And if you start going through her things, you find out that, you know, her parents are actually are, um, they work in art. 
So she's been trying to put herself in the art world very hard, mm. very heavily. So you can start seeing she's something more than just a queen bee. Yeah. Maybe she has a lot of pressure on her in a way. And that's and if, if you follow her arc, you, you end up understanding that she's actually very supportive of the other two girls that are with her yes. at that stage. Uh, and that you end up discovering, you know, that she went to the hospital with one of them and visit the mom and she was very a mental support uh, for that character. So it's it's interesting because yeah, like um, you almost get the feeling that Victoria as a character, it, the reason she's uh, she's jealous of Max because Max doesn't have any pressures per se. As she sees it, Max yeah. doesn't have the same kind of pressures that she does. So she, I think, yeah, I, as you say, it, it, like the reason it's good storytelling is because as you said right at the beginning of this interview. You set up the stereotype that everybody knows, oh, she's the queen bee, oh, he's the jock, oh, he's the, you know, and then you subvert them, you twist them, and you show people, oh, guess what? Even, like, a character that I thought was, a character that I thought was completely irredeemable in the game, which is Nathan Prescott, I was like, nah, Nathan Prescott's a goddamn scumbag. And then, learning more about Nathan, I'm like, oh, like, even still, there's stuff there about mental health and undiagnosed mental health problems and as somebody that's a, a big outspoken mental health advocate mm-hmm. here in ireland like all that stuff really hit like it was like whoa this is not your typical you couldn't I, have I'm done this say, as a triple a game you couldn't have done it no 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 i think the fact that we were this the size that we we were thing allowed us to do more stuff and mm-hmm. the good thing is like no one square uh kind of try to say no you cannot talk about this or you cannot do this thing it's like no you know do the best game you can yeah and that's that that was the whole thing well i i think you very much succeeded uh personally like i think um as i say life is strange one had that like uh especially the dynamic of um as protagonists in a video game like effect, I know, I know. Chloe wasn't necessarily a playable character, but I consider her one of the protagonists in my in my head. I feel like, yeah, yeah, she's it's so symbiotic to Max, like that. It's but like as protagonists, two teenage girls are not your stereotypical video game, or if they are, they're very different to these characters. They're probably overly sexualized and fighting zombies, like yeah. in most other <laughs> games. Um, whereas in this, you had two very believable, insecure, flawed. Uh, not perfect like max you might think max is like meek and quiet and whatever but max has flaws like everybody she can overlook things she can be you know and that's great yeah. good characters have flaws this is another thing i always go on about um exactly is, is it so what what we always said to or try to do at least for the first one and the second one there's no bad guy or no. bad or like the evil person on on the game you could say maybe Jefferson was a bit more mm. because we couldn't explore him enough, lack of time and, yeah. and, and, and screen time, <laughs> in in a in a way of saying no. But um, again, as you said, Jeff, uh, I love um, how we did with Nathan, and actually yes. we got to explore Nathan even before the storm. Oh wow! In okay. a really interesting way. Yeah. So you get he's not. Keep in mind, it's three years before. So he's not the guy you know in at that stage. Okay, he's gonna. So that's what we wanted to do before the storm. is like created that arc where like, okay, you think you know them, but you didn't know them three years ago. They were very different people. Yeah, that will end up being that character you know, and you'll understand why a bit more, why they are how they are. I'm so. I'm very excited to play it because one of my one of my close mates, Andrew Brooker, who's another huge mm-hmm. fan of the games, and he was another person that was pushing me for ages. But it's funny because he was pushing me to check out Life is Strange one, but he had never finished two. And now that I finished two and I'm loving two, I'm like, dude, you gotta go back and play Life is Strange two. It's so good. Um, but he uh, he was raving about Before the Storm. He was like, dude, if you if you played lo- played the first game and you loved it, you need to play Before the Storm because it it adds so much texture to the characters and the world and everything so i i'm all in for that stuff <laughs> As I, what i'll say about that and um about before the storm is one of the challenges we had there is like you know max is kind of quite um i'll say kind of like he's not 
it's not true, but it's kind of like a blank character mm. where everyone can project a lot into her because she's she's very relatable. Yeah. Okay. So she, you can put a lot of choices in there that kind of everyone can relate to. One of the issues with Chloe is she makes always the wrong decisions. Yeah. How you make a character that always makes the wrong decision, let's say, a, that people can impa- uh, you know uh, connect with. Mm. Because you will, as a player, you will always try to make the right choice, regardless. Yeah. Even though you know where she's going to end up being, who she's going to end up being, you will still want to try to fix her. Yes. Somehow. And that was a massive challenge. Like how we can make choices that are still difficult, but are still bad or, or make sense for the character. Yeah. It would not make sense that she suddenly starts acting Super, very nicely to, yeah. to David, for example, it's like, no, sorry, that makes no sense because that's out of character. So it was kind of like a really good challenge to create a character that the choices are still really bad. Yeah. But she's doing it for the best reasons she can, in a way. Yeah. So as I said, check it out because it's 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 really good. I, I look after everything I played now. I I have to uh, because obviously right. I finished Life is Strange one. I adored it. Uh, raved about it to everyone, and everyone's like, "Dude, that game is like seven, six or seven years old now. Why are you suddenly raving about it?" To us? And I'm like, "Cause I just finished it, so it's a discovery for me." Um, but then everyone, uh, it was funny because there was a bit of a divisive reaction on my Twitch stream. I came on and said, "Look, I just finished Life is Strange one. I think I might stream Life is Strange 2. Some people were like, oh, it's 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 not as good as the first. Don't, like, it's not great. Other people were like, it's a masterpiece. It's one of the best games ever made. you got to play it. So in those situations, I'm the type of person that regardless of what anybody says, I have to play something for myself. I can't. Mm-hmm. I don't go off reviews. I don't go off anything like that. I go off personal opinion, you know. Um, and, uh, yeah, so I got the kick in the arse to go finish the game when I was getting Gonzalo Martin on. I was mm-hmm. like, okay, yeah. I'm going to... I'm going to play the game and finish it. I'll do it on stream this time. And, uh, like, that. first I played Captain Spirit. So first I'll jump in a little bit and talk about Captain Spirit because that's yep. fantastic as well. That's a great little, it's, uh, I mean, it is just a little taster. But, I mean, to anybody who hasn't played any of these games that might be watching this, or if you are, there's probably a lot of spoilers in here, so I'd be careful. But, if, but anyway, uh, you should play Captain Spirit because it's free to download and check out yeah. and it gives you a great idea of what the life of strange games are like and it also yes. hits you like in the fields over and over and one of my close mates and another uh, guest of the show nick apostolides was the yeah. dad charles erickson which as soon as he started talking i was like oh that's nick that's my friend nick yeah 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 but no, I, I was I was so shocked though because Nick I knew from Resident Evil Two where he's Leon and he's a hero and he's so like you know and then Charles Erickson is such a like broken man yeah. like yeah. and he plays him in such a way that like you want to hate him you're like dude get off your ass and look after your kid but then you're like but this is a guy that you can tell like up to like probably a couple of years ago had everything and now has nothing. And he's yeah. trying, he's just, like, like anybody could be trapped in this horrible guilt cycle or, you know. I mean, it's, it's when you lose someone that you love, <sighs> it's very easy to kind of go down a spiral. Yes. I mean, the pressure is what it is. So, yeah. you, it's, it's difficult to, to get out of it. It's very easy to let yourself go in a way. And, and unfortunately, you can, yeah, there's stuff that happens. That's it. It's it's also very like easy to judge to prejudge and that's what happens. Like another great thing that these games do is that I, you know, three minutes into Captain Spirit, I'm like, oh, the dad's an ass, and then by the end of Captain Spirit, I'm like, oh, I feel so bad for the dad. Like I can tell that even though he is making some bad decisions, again, there's no good or bad. There's no evil or good. There's just people trying to do the best they can in any given situation. Uh, so Captain Spirit came came about. When we were starting Live Strange 2, we're going through kind of first playable, vertical slice. Then the idea of kind of telling a story as a kind of like a DLC for free for everyone in between for, for the wait, yeah. saying to. And we use that as a kind of like a, like a, I'd say like a tool to 
show everything or, or test everything we wanted to do with two. So kind of like we had a new dialogue system where you can, you know, you can answer your dad, Charles, by um, while you're doing stuff. Or yes. You may not answer him, which is something we never had on a Life Strange game. Um, the fact that things will happen regardless of where you are. So the phone can ring and you might be outside. So oh, you wow. might miss the phone or there is stuff. So if you, for example, if you stand in the, there's a lot of stuff like this, which if you stand in between Charles and the TV, after a certain time, he's going to say, hey, could you move? Hey. I please. was so nervous about standing in front. I, I didn't even pass the TV because I was like, he's going to get mad at me. <laughs> So he, he ends up being mad. If you keep standing there, yeah. he's a point where it's like, hey, dude, that you're not, you know, you're not transparent. So can you, can you move, please? That's so dynamic. That's crazy. And, and for example, I saw you doing like trying to kind of score with the basketball. <laughs> yeah. So there's a way to score there. Oh, no way. So what, what you need to do is like during the break of the game, because there is a break with us, you go to the, the basketball game that Charles is watching. If you go to Charles and start talking to him and there, you're going to have a, like a really bonding moment with him. Okay. And you can ask him to show you how to throw. And okay. he'll show you how to throw. Then if you go back and throw, you'll end up doing basketball. And there is a lot of stuff like this I missed, in that section. I missed a lot of stuff. I knew I have to play it again because I missed so much. I didn't get all the map pieces to go into the, the tunnels. Mm-hmm. I yeah. missed, I missed, but at the same time, I was like, you know what? I know I'm going to play this again. I know I'm going to come back and want to try and do everything. So I'm just going to get through it for now and we'll come back. But yeah, it's, I, I did not know it was as dynamic as you're saying. I did not realize that like literally you could be outside and the phone could ring and you could miss it. That's incredible. Well, for example, if you call the neighbors, depending on what time you call the neighbors, you get the the granny answering. Yeah. If it's later on, you'll hear someone breathing. Now, if you play Life Strange episode, Daniel, two, there's a point where if you walk around downstairs, you'll hear Daniel picking up the phone and breathing. Oh my god, that's amazing! That's attention to detail right there. This is what we this is what we're here for, man. All these little secrets. So, that's so cool. But we wanted to try this in in a kind of like mm. in a safe environment, so a small containers. Um, so we can put it out as well and see how people reacted to different things. I mean, the story, it was kind of really nice. I think it's, you know, we we all kind of, at least some of our nerds, uh, had uh, that imagination, <laughs> vivid imagination. Oh, definitely, we yeah. <laughs> that we had superheroes. I, I played a hundred times thinking I had powers and yep. you know, played to have, like, either I was uh, Ninja Turtle or I was <laughs> Demon. Or, yep. You know, we all played like this, and I think... We're trying to touch that everyone was a kid at some point, and we all have vivid imaginations. I think it's very easy to connect with everyone this way as well. Definitely, but I think what was also really interesting about that is like even chatting to my friend Broker again in the chat while I was playing. His upbringing was similar, like to the the, the games environment. So he's like, it's it's so rough to see this kid with this like this cute kid who looks like Macaulay Culkin like adorable little kid and and the dad who you don't hate because he's obviously not a bad person he's just going through some really rough stuff and the kid is kind of having to grow up so fast like he is doing all the stuff that his dad should be doing but it's like it's that juxtaposition of like it's so cute that he has this lovely imagination but then you're like but is that just a way of coping with this reality of like I have to be the grown up and do all the do the dishes and the trash and turn on the water heater and you know although I love that the water heater again was a little it felt like a reference to Home Alone and I was like he looks like Macaulay Culkin already <laughs> there is there is a lot of like kind of call outs to the, I mean we all yeah. play um, we all kids of the 90s okay? yes. <laughs> um, so influences are all around the place yeah. as you can see <laughs> I think Captain Spirit, it's a great... To me, more developers should take your cue for, with that in the idea of not just doing 
a demo, here's a slice of, you know, 30 minutes of the game or whatever, and instead do something that is like, look, this is an experience from within the world of the game, but it's, and I, some other some other games have done it, I'm not saying that you're, the, like, Life is Strange was the only one to ever do it, but it is, it's, it's such a better way, in my opinion, of, like, introducing you to the mechanics, the world, and it's a demo, it, it's, it always just feels like that, it just feels like, well, this is just a slice of something and I'm not going to get a full experience from it. I'm not. I'm not going to feel like. Whereas at the end of Life, uh, uh, Captain Spirit, yes, it ends with it to be continued. But at the same time, I felt like this is a contained little story that yes. that has a, an arc, an arc, you know. And 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 that was kind of interesting in itself because we wanted just to tell a story, kind of like a side story of a character, so we can go into a deep. I'm kind of explaining a bit more of what happens to that character before yes. we get to meet him. So if you play Captain Spirit, you'll maybe you'll feel more attached to Chris, more attached to Charles. That if you don't, you still get the same experience that the rest of the people, but you get less information about those characters. Mm. As well, keep in mind that for that game, we were coming from a game that was all a white through wine. Was you playing as a teenage girl? We wanted to do something very different too, which you don't own the power. Yes. Is not rewind. It is not a girl that you're controlling. It's something very different. So we wanted yes. to try. Okay, let's. So let's start telling players that this is not a story about Max. This is not this. It's kind of more of kind of like an anthology of, of stories. Yeah, exactly. You know? Like that is something that I think that is why some people don't like. I think the people that were like oh, the first is so much better. I think those are the people that are resistant to the idea of we can have another story with no, with different characters and a totally different... Like, I think that happens in all forms of media, like that if there is a sequel or something that does something totally different to his predecessor, yeah. it's going to be divisive because you're going to have... You're going to split the fan base. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I mean, you... you it's, it's, so um, I love American Horror Story, for example. Yes, yeah. Which is, for, for me, is a big influence. And it's like, you may want, you may like some of the seasons more than others because they resonate with you more than others. Mm. But I think that's good because that means that you can join at any point. Yeah. Without how, you know, just to say, if you play, if you want to play Uncharted Four, say something, I have the feeling that I need to play one, one two, two, three. three. Yeah. To to get the whole thing. Yeah. Regardless if that's true or not. Okay, I'm not entering if it, you can play four alone. But it's like, because it's numbered, you still feel, and it's the same characters, it's the same universe. Yeah. You feel that you need to play the rest to fully understand everything. In an anthology like this, it's like, okay, I can jump on two. If I like to, maybe I'll go to one, and then maybe I'll play before the storm. Yeah. Because it doesn't matter. They all self-contain stories. Exactly. And like, there's there's overlap, and that's the great thing. Like, yeah. There's little bits of overlap. And to me, that's really cool. Like, when I started, it was funny because when I started Life is Strange 2, I was trying to be all like, okay, guys, there's going to be no spoilers for the first game here in this, uh, you know, because they're they're not connected. And the game started and asked, did you sacrifice Arcadia Bay? And I was like, oh, sh- oh shit. <laughs> um, but, uh, like, one thing I will say is kind of going to that point without getting too into it. Mm-hmm. I, I was a little nervous about the Life is Strange comic books because mm-hmm. I, I looked into them and my my thought was, my initial thought was, oh, this kind of sets a canon. It kind of says this is the right ending. But I, I'm sure you can speak to this more because I can see you already probably thinking this. And it, it only dawned on me a long time after I had that initial thought. But I went, no, wait. Multiple universes. There is no canon. Like... Whatever was your decision is your decision, <laughs> and and that's that's a question we we got since the first one. So what's the canon end choice? Yeah. Like there's none. What's what's your end choice? That's your canon choice. That's all there is. Because in a game of choice and consequence, there's no canon. Yeah, there it's can't your be. story. Yeah. If if your story finishes like this, then that's your story, and that's as valid as the other one, and that's what's important. And it's it works so well because there's other games that have that have, in my opinion, kind of screwed the pooch with that concept. Like the ones I can think of as just an example would be Infamous and like Legacy of Kane. Much as I love both of those games, yep. the thing and is, yeah. yeah, like they're incredible games, but like Legacy of Kane, your choice doesn't matter because they go with a canon choice that 
it, it doesn't matter what you choose at the end of the first game. Likewise, no. with uh, with Infamous 2, regardless of what you choose, the game progresses. You know, so I did appreciate that. I did appreciate that when Life is Strange 2 started, it asked me, hey, what was your choice at the end of the previous game? We, we care, and, you know? And we and that's that's because it was it is important. For mm. us, it was important because it was your story. So we need to make sure that that universe reflects your your choices mm. and and live strange too we try to do something a bit bigger or an evolution of the choice and consequence that what we have in one because one is wonderful but you know still that kind of you do this something like this happens on yeah and, and two we try to go more into you know it's not that you do this and something else happens this is kind of like a you're influencing your little brother. Yes. Everything you say, and not everything you say, everything you do, he looks at it and he'll learn and he'll act upon. So your choices are no longer your consequences. Yeah. Are, you are creating kind of like a personality on Daniel. Yeah. It's like where the first game is like the butterfly effect of like yeah. you send ripples out. This one is, as you say, it's all about influence. It's all about, like, it's not... What you do might not affect Sean in the slightest. Sean might... It might not bother him. It might not do anything. But, yeah, Daniel, four episodes from now, could do something. And you're like, why did he do that? Oh, because I did that way back in that exactly. gas station. <laughs> like, <laughs> exactly. But, for example, I always kind of say, if you want to see how, how Daniel is influenced, so you get... Um, so, I think at the, at the second scene where you enter the woods... Mm. Daniel asks you to get a, uh, um, a chocolate uh, a chocolate bar, yeah, chocolate crisp. <laughs> yeah, chocolate crisp. That's it. Yeah, you can say no or yes. Yes means you you steal, and he sees you. So you say no. He'll ask. He'll he'll go and say, okay. Um, um, next time we stop, we'll get a, a chocolate a chocolate crisp. So when you go to the gas station, first thing he says, hey, you promised a chocolate crisp. Can you get me one? <laughs> Now there you can you can buy or you can start stealing. Mm. Okay. You can steal without him without asking him. You can ask him to distract Doris. So that, yeah. that's in can be finished in a lot of different ways. Yeah. So because the idea is that you need food to eat. Okay. How you get the food is up to you. Because I'll say you can go to a trash can outside and eat an apple. And that's yeah. good enough as well. So you don't need to steal or buy anything. Yeah. If you now that has consequences as well. However, Everything if does in these games. <laughs> if if he sees you stealing, then the next two scenes down the line, you'll see that he has stolen something from from um, uh, Brody. Brody. Yes. Yeah. And if at that point you go and say, "Hey, stealing is bad," he'll go, "Well, I saw you do it." I feel so triggered right now because <laughs> this happened to me. <laughs> but I didn't steal in the shop. Oh, no, wait, I did. I stole the... Yeah, I know what I did now. I stole the tent uh, on the way out. <laughs> Again, yeah. um, but, but that as well teaches him that violence is good. Yeah. Uh, so, <laughs> so again, he's still early on the game and there is yeah. ways to to change that. If you Again, if you look at him and what he's doing, you can understand where he's going yeah. and you may want to try to you know correct that if you know how to because that's the whole thing when you're raising a kid or <laughs> it's, it's, it's never obvious no it's, it's never you know it doesn't matter what you do you may think that's the best thing you could do and it could be something wrong because you know there, again it's not right way either as well, the way kids interpret stuff is so different sometimes to what your intention might be, you know. Exactly. Uh, I I have to say, like, I mean, I love Life is Strange 1, and I think it's a fantastic mm -hmm. game. I really do. Mm -hmm. And it, as I say, it's got those kind of Twin Peaksy vibes, and it's it's fun, and it's it's interesting, and it, it's got some great interest, or interesting character kind of tropes that you muck around with and everything. But for me, Life is Strange 2 was on an entirely different level. For me, Life is Strange 2 is one of my... It would be up there in my top five games, I would say, ever. Thank you. Like, that's, legitimately. That's amazing. I'm, I'm actually, like... I'm uh, of, of all the discoveries I've had this year... Like, and this is a year where we've had, like, The Last of Us 2 and uh, Final Fantasy VII Remake and, you know... 
But this was one of those experiences that I'll remember forever. Like, I... Because I think it hits so close to the bone of everything that's been going on the past four years of the world. It just really... It was like a gut punch right when I kind of feel like I maybe needed a gut punch. Um, I'll say I'll say thank you. I mean, for me, it's, it's been... I love Love is Strange 1, but for me, I love a bit more Love is Strange 2. Yeah. Because for me, again, it touches me in, in different ways. So it was, so I have a brother, a little brother. So for me, telling a story about a brotherhood was important. For, yes. At least to me as as who I am. As well, you know, I live in London. Mm. I'm Spanish. Yeah. Not everyone is nice, unfortunately. Um, so racism is around. And mm-hmm. that's something that you might, because you don't see it doesn't mean that it doesn't, doesn't happen. That's that's yeah. the joy of white privilege is a lot of people kind of say, well, that's never happened to me. That's yeah, but- <laughs> too exaggerated. It's like, well, <laughs> have you tried to go somewhere where you're not? Yes, exactly. <laughs> yeah. I can the- tell you how different, how you're going to feel. <laughs> so for me, that game to begin with, uh, when we started talking about the themes we wanted to tackle, mm. I kind of like instantly I remember uh, Michelle and Raul talking about it and it's like yeah you got me I mean it's two brothers yeah okay you know fine like everyone has either you can be dad or mom and have to you know care for a kid that's a you can still connect with that you can have a little brother you it can, can it connect can, with that it can be cousins it can be that you it, have a yeah, little cousin looks up yeah. to you a that's, friend that's yeah the, like it's crazy and, and I think that's a story that I think is really nice so that was one of the things we said to do is like create that relationship very valuable mm. in you needed to feel that connection with daniel Definitely. so when he gets mad or he behaves in a way and you go oh, no, don't don't do this don't do this <laughs> that you feel that connection and you kind of like oh fuck's sake <laughs> Daniel, come on! Daniel, shut up! <laughs> yeah. Or don't do this. And that's good. That's the that's the reaction that we're looking for because a kid of nine year old. It's, it's My daughter is nine, thing. and she's like a Molotov cocktail half the time. It's terrifying. <laughs> <laughs> but that's the thing that yeah. you know you kind of say, "Oh, he's annoying. He should be a very nice." Like. He's nine year old. I will say that that was one of the most frustrating things about playing this game on stream was the amount of people that jumped into a stream for 15 minutes and went, oh, this kid's an asshole. And I was like, you know nothing about this kid. Don't you dare talk about him. You don't know what he's been through. Like, yeah. um, I, I was constantly defending Daniel, even when he was being a little shit. I was still defending him. <laughs> which is good, which is yeah. good. Which, you know, and I think I think that was that was good. I mean, it's, it's a story, even though there's games that deal about brotherhood. I think treat, managing, instead of having one character with a lot of relationships, dealing with a brotherhood kind of story was really interesting from from me at least. Uh, and I know the yeah. team feels the same as well. So, um, And again, dealing with racism. Yes. It, it, was, it was coincidental that this whole thing happened. The happen world was the way it was, yeah. <laughs> right now. Um, but as well, you know, I think it's it's, it's something that some people do not see and it's important that, you know, games, for me, not careful, not all the games need to do this, but I think games can can teach things in a different way that other mediums can. I completely agree. You you know, I think one of my favorite scenes on, uh, on Life is Strange 2 is in chapter four, when you fell asleep and then someone wakes you up. Yes, yeah. Um. And that's for me was was really really touching kind of to work on that scene with the writers when yeah. we did the video lines when kind of we kind of where we're going through every single line seeing every single line needed to be good to you know yeah not to go too far but not to kind of show too little either and and it's important to show it because that thing those things happen you might not believe them oh. Th- Yes, a hundred percent they do, and like that's the reason I agree on hundred percent with you. And the reason I do is because video games. I love movies. They're they're kind of my first love because they were the first form of media I kind of grew up with. I think a lot of people are similar. But what video games can do that movies can't, and movies try to all the mm-hmm. time by making relatable characters that you can relate to. 
But mm -hmm. what, what games can do that they can't is they can literally put you in that person's shoe. They can create empathy. Movies exactly. can't... Movies can imply empathy. They can make you f think you're connected to somebody. Games will put you in the f controls of that person and you have to make those decisions. Uh, exactly. Maybe the same reason that I, I really like The Last of Us 2 is because mm -hmm. it's a game about empathy and making you try to connect and understand a character. Um... Mm -hmm. And I will just say that, like, the scene that you were referencing, I, I wouldn't sing. I'm not going to say any more than that, but I was like, I'm not singing. Not a whole. The thing is, the thing is, is there, so, on that moment, is there a right answer? I don't no. think so. And I think even Gonzalo said this when I was speaking to him. He's like, no matter what you choose, the outcome is kind of more or less the same. Um, what you can get physically beat up the other one is mentally beat up you choose which solution sometimes on these situations there's no there's no way around it no if some people want to do what they want to do they will there's no way around that i will say that that is like look that again talking about relatability and everything like i remember i was i'd say 19 or 20 years old and i was out in limerick which is like a local town here and you know, out drinking with my friends for the first night, probably one of one of the. Well, no, I'm lying. I was going out drinking since I was like six, sixteen. But yeah, I was out drinking with my friends, and a, uh, one of the girls I was with asked me to walk back to a taxi rank to get a taxi home. So I walked her to the taxi rank, and on the way there, two big kind of jock guys started hurling abuse at her across the street. And so under my breath, I said something like, "You know, fucking idiots" or something like that. And then they were like, "Hey, what did you say to us? What did you say to us?" And came across the street. And like you just said, the reason I say this is so relatable is because, like you said, in that moment, I went in my head, I went, no matter what you say at this point, these guys are going to beat the shit out of you, probably, because that's what they were out here looking for, and now you've, yeah, you've... You just give them an excuse. That's yeah. all. That's all they need. Doesn't matter what you say or no. why you try to apologize. No, no. You're getting it. Yeah, exactly. And, and I think that's why games are important, because you can, you can step on someone else's shoes that you might yeah. not encounter. So... A lot of hopefully a lot of people don't leave these situations yes right? but it's good to understand that these situations happen and what happens when it's you there so you are able to live someone else's life yes in that moment and see how bad it is and it's unfair yes it is completely unfair but that's that's happened. that's life is strange. Or as one of my one of the people in my stream kept saying, "Your life is strange too." She's a huge fan of the the series, Jessica. She kept saying, "Life is fucked." But I I do I think um yeah for me the the race issues the way it handles <laughs> and even not even necessarily but like the fact that again. I love video games. I know you love video games. But one thing that video games do struggle with, or at least kind of historically, maybe it's it's opening up in the last decade maybe, but was definitely, or is definitely, people of colour. Like, as protagonists, mm. as playable protagonists, um, mm. and not secondary characters or, you know, an option in a game where you're selecting. Like, I, I loved that Life is Strange 2 was about two Latino brothers. You know what I mean? And and yep. one who kind of is more in touch with that side of his identity, of his cultural identity, and the other who's kind of a little bit, you know, Daniel's young and he doesn't speak Spanish. He doesn't, like, Daniel yep. kind of doesn't understand that side yep. of his identity, whereas Sean is so in tune with it. Um, and it's, yep. it's, I love that. I love that. Because, again, it taught me stuff about this culture, you know. Um, and, and and again, it, that was that was very important from the beginning. So it was always going to be uh, Latin American kids, yes, because we we needed to kind of as well we were going to tell the story about Karen, which was a, a different flawed character as well, mm. um, with its own reason. But I think it was very important to kind of tell the story of someone that's not your typical hero in a video game, you know. And Sean is Latin American, and he loves you know from songs he says sentences because he's been raised with 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 his dad mm. which he's mexican and he yeah. kind of you know when you're from you have a second language sometimes you kind of when you curse you curse in spanish or in your language yeah. and sometimes when stuff happens you kind of let some of those words out and they become like for example the enano style Inano, yeah. you know that sort of stuff it's it it, it is part of 
culture in itself. And, it, you know, I think it's interesting to, to have those type of characters in, in games. Definitely. It's interesting and important. It is important, I yeah. think, that we do keep stepping forward with these mediums. First game as well, to, to be fair, first game really stepped it up with LGBT representation. Yeah. Um, and then the second game kind of carried that tradition on as well and also had this other multi Like, the second game it elevated it all. Uh, like you said, I think sometimes when people think a game is bigger, i.e. like it's like if you're playing Grand Theft Auto 3 and then you play Grand Theft Auto San Andreas, San Andreas is bigger because it's physically bigger. <laughs> I mean, yes, there's millions more things to do and everything, but in something like Life is Strange and Life is Strange 2, technically one is not bigger than the other because they're both episodic games that play out a certain way. But the themes can feel bigger. The, the, the type of journey can feel bigger. The amount of stuff that it's trying to explore in this one story can feel vastly bigger, which I think it does, you know. Um, but yeah, I as I say, for me, it's up there, like, top top five, possibly top three experiences. I just Thank adore you. it. Um, but yeah, uh, I oh, so kind of to move away from, from the Life is Strange games just temporarily for a little bit mm -hmm. as well. We were kind of nerding out a little bit before we came on <laughs> to, to recording. Uh, oh, that was how I knew I knew this was going to be a good interview because we were nerding out about the PS5, <laughs> um, which I'm presuming, obviously, you got your hands on as well. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I was lucky. I was really lucky. I, um, I was not going to get one. Like, it was not happening for me at all mm -hmm. until a person who watches the, the show on YouTube was like, I got one. I'll give it to you at retail price because I, I'm probably not going to play it over Christmas. I jumped out of bed. I was in bed kind of sobbing myself to sleep because I was so upset that I didn't get one. And uh, I jumped out of bed, drove to Limerick as fast as I could, like probably broke every speed limit in the world and uh, got home with it. And yeah, I'm, I, I'm so... I, I, the person wants to remain anonymous, but T, thank you so much. You saved my Christmas. Um, and I do feel really badly for anybody who didn't get... I want to make that very clear. Like it's... It's such a rough situation for people who didn't get one. Um, yeah. But at the same time, I the first two weeks, I couldn't afford, because the PS5 cost me so much, because I was get, intending on getting the digital, but then all I could get off the off T was the physical. So it was an extra 100. So I couldn't buy any games at launch when, or when I got it. So I was playing Astro's Playroom and Bug Snacks. Yeah. But I think yeah. we talked about it, like, even like, briefly. Astro's Playroom is so much better than it has any right to be. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So so I have to say, so I played Astro Playroom on VR. Yes. And that's an amazing platformer. I love platformers. So Same. I'm a huge fan. Like Mario. Yes. Yeah, whatever, whatever games, bring it. So when I played play, the, the new one, the Playroom, I think it's called, um, I, it, it's just good it's a good platformer yes. but for me is a tribute to the history of video games it's beautiful it's I mean, so I keep beautiful thinking like, oh is that this and is that oh that's that's final fantasy that's, that's so resident weird. evil that's, that's yeah that's, <laughs> and that's um i wish i think there was shadow Jesus the colossus shadow uh, of the colossus journey at a, point. a journey yes, yes. heavy rain a uh, little right. origami figure. Yes. <laughs> there is Uncharted as well. So <sighs> I was like, oh my God, this is kind of... Plus on top of that, they were telling you what the processor of the new yes. console is. They were kind of telling you the whole thing of what the new console is. Yes. In a very nice way. So, and plus the controller is... Oh, it's, oh my God. It's, so, the only <laughs> thing I'll say is doesn't matter how much we rave and talk about how good that controller is. Until you feel it. You, you need to feel it. <laughs> yeah. You really need to feel it. And that's the perfect game. To do. Oh, it is. A hundred percent. Because I, uh, that was the only experience I had of it for about two weeks was that. And, I mean, Bug Snacks doesn't, uh, it does use it actually because when you're aiming stuff and mm -hmm. like it does, but like the Astro's Playroom is a perfect introduction yeah. to it. But one thing I hadn't experienced with it was gunplay, you know, triggers and, and stuff. So, I found out somebody posted that. Oh, by the way, The Last of Us Two has been patched and has haptic feedback. So I booted it up and I started using the bow, and I was like, "Oh my god, the, the triggers!" Okay, you, yeah, I'm, I mean, I'm feeling love is strange too. I love uh, uh, Last, Last of Us Two, so I need, I need, to, I need to, I need to get 
back to it. Yeah. <laughs> it's worth it's worth just even throwing it on to play with the haptic haptic feedback for a little yeah. bit. I mean, the haptic feedback is a game. I've said it so far that there's. I bet you're. I have a feeling that because you're a game designer as well and stuff. I, in a former life on much smaller titles than you've been involved in I was also a game designer um, but what I'll say is like for me polygon counts and graphics cool grand it's nice when they improve but it doesn't for me what makes this next gen console feel next gen is the load times the fact that the lack there of load times and the controller to me those yeah. two things are what make this next generation a hundred percent. So I remember playing Playroom, uh, the Astro one. I kind of like my mind went like, <laughs> everything you can do. I think I could do this. In this game, and I thought, <laughs> yes. Oh my god, I could do this other thing. So it kind of exploded because it gives me, as a creator, more tools yes. to connect with the player. New something that I didn't consider before. Hmm. Now I can do that I couldn't do before. So for me. In kind of like the story in video games, I always say that I think the biggest improvements, yeah, we have bigger machines. We have, you know, actually, you want to go PC, you can have the biggest yeah. crazy PC that you want. Cool. That's going to make your game look beautiful, amazing. But that's it. Gameplay wise, doesn't bring anything else to the mix. So if you look at how the consoles have evolved, we start with a NES with two buttons. Yes. And a, and a, and a D-pad. Then we had six buttons for the Super NES. So yes. four plus and two, two shoulder triggers. buttons. Yeah. Shoulders. Then we have the... Um, that was great. We have more inputs, more yes. stuff we could do. Then we had the um, the stick sticker to play with the Nintendo 64. Yes. It was first Nintendo 64. They had the stick, PlayStation yeah. Put, put the two of them. Yeah. Then you have the Rumble Pack that Nintendo 64 brought, which then everyone the else used. Shock, yeah. <laughs> which, it was amazing. It was like, oh my God, I can feel stuff. Yeah. Then every single time it was kind of like, it was the way you as a player interact with the game in a new way. And I think the other big thing, maybe in graph, the biggest change was from 2D to 3D. To 3D, yeah. yeah. And the first, the first job to 2D to 3D was not what you'd call elegant like it was not especially those early 3d platformers with the exception of mario uh 64 which was kind of became god tier like became the the yeah. one that but like a lot of the early ones didn't understand camera they were like i have no idea where to place camera which is why naughty dog were so intelligent with crash bandicoot and went hey guess what the camera is going to stay behind you all the time and you're just yeah. going to run forward we're going to treat this like a 2d platformer but just shift the perspective um yeah. but yeah I, but I think, yeah, when we went from PS1 to PS2 era and we got, let's say, Grand Theft Auto 3, Devil mm -hmm. May Cry, um, a couple of those, Anamusha, you know, it was like, mm -hmm. whoa, now yeah. we're seeing what 3D graphics can be. Can do. Yeah, yeah. I do agree. And yeah, as you see, the thing is with consoles, it's been an iterative process. Like, we've seen it, that like little tweaks with each one. Xbox came along and really, Xbox, I mean, network play, like, Network play would not be what it is today if it was not for Xbox Live in the mid 2000s. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, and you just saw each, and obviously each generation, the other consoles steal a little bit of something from the other one because but that's, that's but what that's it has fine, to be. Like, yeah. It's the same with games. You will never find a game that does everything that no one else has seen before. Mm. We all take, okay, this is good, this is working, let's see trade, let's add something else. So reinventing the wheel is never, never the, good, the way to go, to be honest, because that never works yeah people cannot grasp either thing as as players cannot grasp so we can grasp as a few little changes on what we know yes so having too many we'll go this is weird um, <laughs> I, I don't get this sorry off so it's always iterative and you take examples from yeah console from consoles games from other games and that's fine yeah. you know there were there was a lot of people complaining about you know phoenix rising being a copy of breath of the wild <laughs> Which I played Breath of the Wild, love Breath of the oh, Wild. Oh, same. <laughs> but, you know, there's but several things. One, Phoenix Rising can be in all the other platforms. So, people that never managed to play um, Breath of the Wild, like Breath of the Wild, now can, they can yeah. play it. Is that a bad thing? Let's start. No, it's yeah. not. Two, it is not like Breath of the Wild. It has a lot of 
references and and you know it takes a lot of gameplay mechanics but it has as well some gameplay mechanics from um from Assassin's Creed yeah the it's other I was going to say the other Ubisoft titles yeah and it's good and you know what what I love about the, that game is a comedy game yes yeah it's got a bit of lightheartedness to it which is so weird <laughs> nowadays games yes, you know yes. they're all two series i want to <laughs> just crack a laugh you know, i love monkey island i love all those classic games where you just laugh for a bit and it's fine it's why like i mean again it's why i enjoyed the hell out of astros playroom and bugs next because even though bugs next it's quite funny because bugs next starts out uh like just very lighthearted, and then it goes to like these really dark places and talks about stuff that i was like what the this is supposed to be a meme game this is just meant to be nonsense stop trying to explore really deep topics <laughs> let me let, let me laugh for a bit <laughs> yeah, but i loved it um yeah. no but i do agree i mean i haven't played uh phoenix rising yet but people said the same thing i felt when i first asked people i was like what's genshin impact when it was first come out Oof. and people started saying i mean to that <laughs> people I, i'm addicted to that <laughs> yeah. but people started going well did you like breath of the wild and i was like well yeah breath of the wild is like one of my favorite you know games possibly of definitely the last decade and they're like mm-hmm. Uh, oh well you'd probably like Genshin Impact so and then when I played it I was like okay I can see on a surface level how there are comparisons here like visually in places yeah. it's got that kind of watercolory look and you know but I'm like these are very very dramatically different games <laughs> like yes um, mechanic wise I mean yeah you have an open world yeah aesthetically might be similar in terms of visuals for the world but mechanic wise is totally just- different <laughs> has nothing to do yeah. with Breath of the Wild. Which, again, it, I think it's good to be able to see, oh, that comes from Breath of the Wild. And that's yes. good because I think, you know, there's a lot of games that do good things. It's good that some other games borrow that from them. But it's and sometimes it's, it's, it's to evolve. Sometimes it's, yeah, when you see the influences in a game, that's what makes the game stand out to you. Because great example of this is, I finally was able to buy myself a, a game and I was like, okay, I only have, I have under a certain amount so I can't get Spider-Man, I can't get Demon Souls, I can't get whatever. So I got the Pathless and mm-hmm. I was straight away, I was like, oh my God, this is like Journey mixed with Breath of the Wild, mixed with Shadow of the Classes, mixed with, you know, and I was like, it was the influences that made me like it. It wasn't even necessary. It was like the fact that I could go, it's like all these games that I love. Yeah. Therefore, I like it. <laughs> you know? but, but that's the thing. I mean, you, you know, at least I'll, there's a lot of designers. There's a lot, lot of ways to start a project. But when, for example, I start a new project, yes. what I do is like I buy blog, buy buy bibliography. So it's like bibliography. So I take books, movies, TV series, games. Yes. That the new game I'm doing will drink from. Yes, and you know the whole team needs to play those games. The whole team needs to see those movies, and so we all have a common language. And you know, some might be okay. So you know, we're gonna. I love from. I'm gonna invent now. Um, well, well, you know, Last of Us to how they play with the uh, bows and arrows. Yes, a lot of mechanics. So everyone should play that and understand how that works because maybe we're gonna do something very diff- similar as a base, but then we're gonna add this here and, the, mm. and these. And I think that's really important for, from the create, creative point of view to have that knowledge of what you're going to create, what you have, and then how you can add something on top. So, I totally agree. One of the things back when I was a, a dev, one of the things that used to kind of, like, I understand it, but it used to frustrate me, was mm-hmm. when other devs or other designers would say, I would say like, oh, have you played Infamous 2? And they're like, no, I have no time to play games at the moment. I haven't I haven't the time. And it just, the reason it always irked me was I was like, if you were a doctor, you would read textbooks. You would read, yeah. you know, find out what the, what the latest stuff in medicine, what's happening. If you're a game designer, you should be playing games because that's how you're going to learn about advancements in games or what works, what doesn't. Um, and what's becoming new trends. Yes. What's, you know, the new mechanic that some... That a new game has appeared. And, and then go back and play a JRPG from 1995 and learn something about, oh, cool, they did this thing and nobody else really picked up on it. We could totally borrow that and use it yep. this way. Um, exactly. You need to always be exactly. playing. <laughs> so I'm, I'm 100, that's my way of creating as well. Yes. So that doesn't mean that we are, the only thing we do is copy because that's not true. No, yeah. But, you know, it's like when creating a book, when doing a movie, yeah. you have references. Style guide, it's... reference, uh, mood exactly. board. Uh, yeah, like... 
hundred percent. That's, that's part of the greatest pro- the creative process of for the game designer. You need other games. Yes, as well. So, I like uh, Alejandro. I feel like we're the type of people that we could sit here for two plus hours probably talking about all this stuff because and what i'm gonna do is once this this lockdown is all over and everything i do go to london typically a couple of times a year for fight fest and everything so i will hit you up once all this madness is behind us and we'll just sit in a bar somewhere and talk game design for for hours on end because i think oh, we yes, could please. <laughs> please please i mean we can we can bring barry as well so yeah, if he comes yes, around yes and exactly. we can have like a nice catch up there you oh go. that'd be amazing um but you no. Know, uh, I've loved this whole conversation. I've loved it because, like, the work that you've done has, as I say, I, I, if I was involved in a project, this is the way I'm going to kind of close this out. If I was involved in a project, which to date, I don't know if I have been, definitely not of the magnitude of Life is Strange, but, like, if I was involved in a project that moved somebody the way that Life is Strange 2 in particular moved me, I that would change my life forever more just knowing that there was a piece of media that i put a bit of myself into that is irreparably changed somebody <laughs> um and so i gotta say a massive kudos to you a massive congratulations mm-hmm. because being part of something like that is is just it's an incredible accomplishment yeah i mean it's it's, it's it, it has changed me a lot it has changed um the way i look at games as well um, and the only thing I'll say, you know, we when we launched Life is Strange One, um, after episode two, we started receiving letters in the office. Donald received, I received them here as well, mm. of people that got that their life changed because yes. of Life is Strange One, and have no. I mean, I we didn't set to do this to, you know, for this purpose. Yes, but it's really touching when someone writes you, spends the time they spend writing that letter, like physical letter mm. or doing cosplays or doing like anything, you know, and sending it to you saying, Hey, look at this because this, this moved me or I love this because that, you know, I can relate to these or I love this so much. I, I get the tattoo or it's, it's just, I have really no words for, for, I... for the fans of Life Strange and the community of Life Strange. It kind of has changed me a lot. I can tell that. That's um, that's incredible. I, the closest thing that I can relate to with all of that is that my second film, The Perished, when that was on, when I was on the festival circuit with that movie, that's a movie about Ireland. It's about a very taboo subject in within Ireland. It it's a film that a lot of people hate, a lot of people love. It's going to divide right down the middle because it's talking about touchy stuff. Um, I was at a screening in London, uh, and. A lady came up to me after the screening and was like, I grew up in um, the Caribbean and my upbringing would have been very like the girl's upbringing in your movie. And I want to say like this, it was such a cathartic experience to watch this movie and see something that I related to so deeply. And I remember just being like blown away by that because that was the first time in my career as a filmmaker that somebody had come up and really told me your movie had a, a, an effect on me. Um mm-hmm. And so, like, and then I had that a little bit more when we t- when we went to the U.S. with the premiere in the U.S. I got it a little bit more. A- admittedly, in the U.S., because of the subject matter, it's about abortion. So, because of the subject matter, there was a lot of um, also there was a lot of like, oh, thank you so much, great for doing a film about this. And then there was a lot of, how dare you make a movie? I'm like, okay, cool, it's fine. Uh, we gotta open those, we gotta get get those discussions going. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> You know, it's, yeah. it's, a, it's an important theme as well to talk to. Yeah. About. So, hundred yeah, percent. No, no, but it, it's but it's good. It's good. I mean, it's 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 great when you get uh, you know uh, works like this out, and and it, there is no way, there's no 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 better pay or no better no. reward for your job than someone else enjoying it, and that's you know that's the reason we do these things. To be honest. Exactly. It's to evoke a reaction. That's what I always say. Whether somebody jumps, cries, screams, laughs, it doesn't matter. As long as somebody gets a reaction, I'm happy <laughs> with what I've yeah. done. Um, yes, I'm here. But, and then the other thing I want to say is that's about your work on Life Strange, but also just listening to you talk about your passion for games, your passion for, for everything to do with games. Like It makes me feel like if we have more game designers like you or if, if a lot of the other game designers out there out there are like you, we're in good hands for the future of next gen and everything, in my opinion, because 
that's what we need is people with passion, not just looking at it from uh, how much money can we make off this next iteration, but uh, what can we do? What can we change? How can we elevate this genre? Um, so yeah, keep it up. Thank you. <laughs> and I, I can tell you there's tons of designers like me Excellent. out there <laughs> trying to, trying their best to come up with the best games that you guys hopefully enjoy at some point. So <laughs> uh, yeah, no, it's, it's, it's a, it's a great community. And I, Thank you, thank you for no problem. Uh, you were on social media. You're on Twitter. You were on yeah. Twitch. You're a Twitch streamer yes. too. Uh, yes, very I, cool. I started two days ago. I have to say, <laughs> so, we, we we'll make sure everybody goes there. Guys, go and follow. Go and follow Andrew on Twitch, okay? <laughs> and uh, on Twitter, I'll put links in the description below anyway, so that people can check out cool. all your social media profiles and everything. Uh, and I've seen you are quite active, which is great, like on Twitter and everything. Um, yeah. It's always nice so to follow I'll, somebody. I'll, I'll reply always to everyone as soon as I can. And, you know, I'll, I always kind of try to interact with everyone that, you know, interacts with me. Because that's, you know, and really good. obviously, we know you cannot talk about anything you're working on at the moment. But all I'd say is from myself and presumably my my viewers, we can't wait for whatever you're working on. Because <laughs> with the legacy you've you've come through, <laughs> like especially <laughs> like we're, we're expecting big things, no pressure. <laughs> 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 I hope I can deliver there. <laughs> I'm joking. I'm joking. Okay. <laughs> no, no. But uh, yeah, I mean, I, hopefully you'll enjoy everything that I, that I do. At least enjoy. You know? Exactly. Yeah, that's it. So, guys, that is it. Just to close this out. Uh, thank you so much, Alejandro, for your time. And uh, I, I'm going to ask you once again to please, uh, over underneath Alejandro, there's a subscribe thing. Uh, there's a like button down there and a subscribe. Please hit both. Uh, and stick around for all we've got coming uh, and then beyond that I'll just say what I always say at the end of every video that I make because it's important especially in 2020 it's been one of the most important lessons I've learned which is let's survive together and peace out thanks Alejandro thank you <laughs>